uh, for large P, the mass is very small compared to the first two terms. And remember, we map to a unit vector by taking the unit vector whose coefficients are a multiple of px, py, and sigma and m. But that unit vector for large P, the third component is zero. So it maps infinity in momentum space to the equator in matrix space, in the space of these sigma matrices. That's what happens for large P, but if P isn't large, we can't ignore M. So for example, if P is zero, we only have M, and we map to the north pole of M is positive, or the south pole of M is negative. And the image of the whole mapping, well, this is, first of all, the full mapping. Oh, sorry. There should have been an M squared in the denominator. The denominator should have been P square root of Px squared plus Py squared plus M squared. But otherwise, this is the exact mapping. And its image is the upper or lower hemisphere, depending on the sign of M. I've drawn it for positive M, so we got, the image was the upper hemisphere. And the winding number is a half sine M, and that's the churn simons coefficient that we get by integrating out psi. <clears throat> now, for the moment, I want to consider a trivial theory. We'll get to something non-trivial, but we need to start with a theory we understand, which will be a theory that's trivial. So I'll add to psi a second fermion, psi prime of mass minus m. So the total turn Simon's coefficient obtained by integrating out psi and psi prime is half the sine of m plus the sine of minus m, so it's zero. So this theory has no effect of turn Simon's coupling in bulk. And I'd like to pick a boundary condition so that there also are no edge states, so that the theory is trivial even along the boundary. So a theory that's trivial in the bulk and in the boundary at low energies is certainly physically consistent and anomaly free. So we work on the half space where x1 is positive. We want a boundary condition that ensures that nothing happens along the boundary. Well, we can do something like what we did in the first lecture. In the first lecture, I said a Dirac fermion in four dimensions had a symmetry-preserving boundary condition. And for a pair of, and then it involved multiplying by i gamma 1. Here we've got two Dirac fermions in three dimensions, but the boundary condition we want is similar, that one fermion is i gamma 1 times the other fermion along the boundary. And I want to show you why I picked that boundary condition. Remember, psi and psi prime of equal and opposite masses. So here are their Dirac equations. And also remember that in 2 plus 1 dimensions, the mass is odd under reflection. So I have two fermions that each live on a half space. But I make a reflection and combine the two fermions to one fermion on the whole space. I define, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. I want to, unfortunately, the equation as I wrote it is inadequate, and maybe I do want to use the blackboard. Uh, if we could turn on the blackboard light for a second. The way I wanted to write the formula. Well, sorry, let's see how I did write it. <clears throat> so I, we have two, I hope, first of all, you can all see now that there's light on. But we have two um, Fermi fields that are each defined on the half space x1 positive. But I combine them together into a single Fermi field that lives whether x1 is positive or negative. So what I wrote in the slide isn't in detail enough because I didn't explain what was happening to x1 and x2. So it was meant to be like this. I take psi if x1 is positive. Well, to define psi hat of x1, I use psi if x1 is positive, but if x1 is negative, I use super psi prime at minus x1, which is positive. So. Does the blackboard light make it hard to see the slides? No? We'll just leave it on then in case we want to use it again. So anyway, we combine sine psi prime to a single fermion psi hat 
which is defined everywhere, and it simply obeys the Dirac equation with a constant mass. That fact depends on the fact that psi and psi prime had opposite masses, and that the Dirac mass is odd under reflection. So, a Dirac fermion in R3 has plane wave solutions, but it doesn't have any boundary localized or half space. It doesn't have any solutions that are localized near x1 equals 0. So that's a shortcut to explaining that this system with this boundary condition does not have any edge localized modes. Edge localized modes would correspond in terms of psi hat to modes localized near x1 equals 0. But you presumably know that the Dirac equation with a constant mass has plane wave solutions which are continuum normalizable in, three, two, in two plus one dimensions, but not localized near x1 equals zero. So we went, we've gone to all this trouble to find a system which is trivial in both the bulk and the boundary and which we know is consistent. I didn't give a formal proof it's consistent. It would have involved showing that the Dirac equation of the combined system has a positive determinant, positive and well, therefore well-defined, completely anomaly-free. Now, while keeping the fermion kinetic energy and the boundary conditions fixed, we change the sign of the mass of psi prime and move to the region where both psi and psi prime have the same mass m, which is positive. This cannot affect the consistency of the theory because m, in relativistic language, is a soft perturbation. M is a sub-leading term in the Dirac equation. It's a relevant operator. So we're, we've perturbed by a strictly relevant operator that doesn't affect the ultraviolet behavior, can't affect any anomalies, and doesn't affect the consistency of the theory. So because the theory was consistent when the masses were equal and opposite, it's still consistent. Of course, when the mass of psi prime goes through zero, the theory becomes ungapped and passes through a phase transition, but that doesn't affect its consistency. What is on the other side of this transition? Well, on the other side of the transition, both fermions have masses of the same sign. So the whole conductivity, in other words, the coefficient of chern simons in the effective action, is now a half times 1 plus 1, which is 1. And by itself, that would be anomalous, so something has to cancel it. And what cancels it is that the Dirac equation for psi hat now doesn't have a constant mass anymore. Now it was psi and psi prime that had constant masses, but because the mass is odd under reflection, where x1 is negative, the mass becomes negative. So now we have a three-dimensional fermion whose mass is positive on one side and negative on the other side. And the fact that the mass of psi hat changes sign in passing through x1 equals zero means that now there is a chiral edge mode. In other words, psi hat does have um, modes that are um, that are localized near x1 equals 0 and the explicit onsatz is like this So psi naught should be an eigenstate of i gamma 1. On the fly, I'm not sure if I have the sign right in this equation. And then it should obey the two-dimensional Dirac equation. But gamma 1 is actually the chirality operator in two dimensions. So psi naught is going to be a chiral massless fermion in two dimensions. And then it decays exponentially away from x1 equals 0. So explicitly, that's the ansatz for the chiral edge mode. And very similar ansatzes were written by Kane a couple of times and also actually by me, because we've had similar examples earlier in my lectures. So now we have a churn simons coefficient of 1 in the bulk, and we have a chiral edge mode on the boundary. And that certainly shows we have now a manifestly consistent construction of a 2 plus 1 dimensional system then the bulk has an effective action turn simons times 1, and along the boundary it has a chiral edge mode. Had we started with k identical pairs psi and psi prime, we would have had a bulk action of k times turn simons and k chiral edge modes. 
So <clears throat> this gives a manifestly consistent construction of that combination. Yes? Uh, well, when you said holomorphic, you probably meant smooth because M is real. And it's not going to be smooth because there's a phase transition at M equals zero where the system isn't gapless. Oh, but I can't analyze Well, uh, it's a little bit unphysical to answer what happens for complex M, so I don't want to try to answer on the fly. I'll just remark that in four, your idea would be better in four dimensions, where by turning on a gamma five term, it's physically sensible to consider a complex mass. Since it's not physically sensible here, I don't want to attempt to answer on the fly. But at least for real physical systems, you would go through a phase transition. There are complex, okay, I don't want to say more. So we've confirmed the consistency of the combined system without having to investigate the anomalies of the chiral edge modes. So the last thing I will do, but you've heard some about it from other lectures, is to explain how Haldane realized this system in a condensed matter model, which was a small perturbation of the standard band Hamiltonian or graphene. So when I started planning these lectures originally, I wanted to do some examples of explicit band calculations and explicit demonstrations of boundary states, but I found it was just going to be too time consuming. So the five minutes I'll say about this is all that I was left with from those good intentions. So first of all, graphene is a two-dimensional atomic monolayer of carbon atoms arranged in a hexagonal or honeycomb lattice, which is in that picture, the atoms being on the vertices. A carbon atom has six electrons, two of them are in 1s states, and three more go into forming covalent bonds. So each atom has three nearest neighbors and forms a covalent bond with each neighbor, so that uses up three more electrons. So we're left with one more electron six being two plus three, and we're left with one more electron, and that one more electron is going to go into the 2pz orbital, where z is orthogonal to the plane, but it might have spin up or spin down. And since, because there are um, two spin states and only one electron to fill them, only half of the 2pz states are supposed to be filled. <clears throat> now, uh, if you haven't, well, an elementary but fact, but it takes a while to visualize if you've never thought about it, is that the honeycomb lattice has two atoms per unit cell. So I've labeled some points by A and some other points by B. There are translation symmetries between the A sites and those translation symmetries map B sites to B sites. But if you think about it a little, you'll see that there's no translation symmetry that maps an A site to a B site. So the unit cell under translation contains one A site and one B site. And if we allow one quantum state, ignoring spin, one quantum state per atom, being the 2pz orbital, but because we've got both the A site and the B site, it's going to make up two bands, and we want to half fill the two bands. So what happens is uh, partly, largely, well, the interesting things are dictated largely by symmetry, because otherwise they wouldn't be interesting. Anything you would learn from an explicit crude strong coupling band model that couldn't be justified more generally from symmetries would be, an, in the real world, would probably be a so-so approximation and would not lead to the really interesting behavior of graphene. But before saying what you can learn from symmetries, you need a starting point, which is a simple model you can solve, which is in the universality class you want to talk about. So the simple model is the one in which Hamiltonian describes nearest neighbor hopping with some amplitude t from the A lattice to the B lattice and vice versa. See, the nearest neighbors of an A site or a B site and vice versa. So nearest neighbor hopping will give a purely off-diagonal Hamiltonian that goes from an A site to a B site and vice versa. Now, we want to write down in momentum space the nearest neighbor hopping Hamiltonian. And your first thought might be to specify Px and Py, the components of the momentum and write down something, but if you do that, it will be longer than I'm about to tell you. A much easier way to do it is to pick coordinates that are well adapted to the symmetry of the lattice. So I'll say what the momentum is as follows. I pick three A sites. 
Well, I've picked one B site. Then I pick the three nearest neighbor A sites. And I take a plane wave wave function that's one here. And then it will be some phase here and some other phase here. And alpha and beta are coordinates on the Brillouin zone. In other words, by saying what alpha and beta is, I've told you what is the momentum of the plane wave. You can say it in some other way, but alpha and beta are actually the simplest coordinates to use. <clears throat> so I've specified a plane wave by picking alpha and beta. And now we can write down nearest neighbor hopping from the A lattice to the B site, which is right here, which is that the amplitude will be 1, e to the i alpha, or e to the i beta, times the amplitude t. OK, sorry. I already said this, but alpha and beta are convenient parameterization of the Brillouin zone, so they're arbitrary angles. And they give a good parameterization of all the possible plane waves. The total hopping amplitude to the indicated B site is therefore the sum of the neighboring amplitudes, 1 e to the i alpha and e to the i beta, times the hopping constant t. The Hamiltonian is Hermitian, so the B to A hopping is the complex conjugate of that. And therefore, the momentum space Hamiltonian in the AB basis is what I've written. Now, because it's purely off-diagonal, unless the off-diagonal matrix element is zero, the two eigenvalues are equal and opposite and not zero. So a band crossing occurs if and only if there's a zero mode of H. So the condition for a zero mode which will be the condition for a band crossing, and that will be a Dirac point, is the same as the condition for a zero mode of H, but that just means that this matrix element, or equivalently this one, which is its complex conjugate, should vanish. So the equation for a zero mode is this one, where alpha and beta are supposed to be real. Well, since the equation is real, it implies that e to the i alpha and e to the i beta are complex conjugates. And since they're complex conjugates, their real part has to be minus a half to make the equation work. And since they have modulus 1, there are precisely these two solutions. e to the i alpha and e to the i beta are cube roots of 1, which are complex conjugates. So there are two points where the Hamiltonian has zero modes. And if you expand around it, so what are you then supposed to do? At those two points, the Hamiltonian is zero. Well, since the lights are conveniently on, we can just go on a little bit. This Hamiltonian is F1 times sigma 1 plus F2 times sigma 2. And then we want to calculate the matrix of derivatives, the derivative of F1 and F2 with respect to alpha and beta. And I claim that that determinant of derivatives is non-zero. So that's a short calculation. Uh, from this, you can read off what are f1 and f2 and calculate the matrix of derivatives. If you think carefully, you'll find an e possibly an even shorter way to do it. But I won't explain that right now, because it might be confusing. And anyway, why should the matrix be zero? Nothing was chosen about the model that would make that determinant not be zero. So in fact, it isn't zero. And that's all we need to know to know that we're going to see Dirac-like behavior. So if we linearize around these values of the momenta, we get two-dimensional massless fermions. And it happens at two values of the momenta. So that's the answer for the simple band model of graphene. And it was computed, I think, around 1950. So, Expanding around either solution, the determinant is non-zero, so we get a Dirac-like Hamiltonian. And we found two Dirac points in the Brillouin zone. So, but to make this interesting, we should know that this massless behavior is protected by the symmetries. So we have to look at the symmetries of the graphene lattice. So I've drawn the graphene lattice, and the easiest way to see the symmetries is to pick the, one of the hexagons and then draw a point at the center of the hexagon. And then you can see that, apart from translation symmetries, the symmetries are as follows. 
if p is the center of one of the hexagons, you can rotate about p by any multiple of 2 pi over 6. And you can also reflect along various axes through p. So you can obviously reflect on this horizontal axis that passes through two corners of the hexagon. But you can also reflect around a vertical axis that passes through two faces of the hexagon. <clears throat> and those are different. And so you have to see what these symmetries do to the two Dirac points. Well, if you look at it a little bit, you'll see that there's a reflection that maps a given Dirac point to itself. I don't remember if that's the reflection through the corners of the hexagon or through the faces, but I recommend as an exercise to figure it out. And once you find the answer, that one of these, although, sorry, well, in a sense, I'll tell you, well, okay. once you find that one of the reflections exchanges, maps a given Dirac point to itself, that tells you that the massless Dirac modes at that point are truly gapless, that they're protected by that reflection symmetry. It's not the only way to explain why those points are protected, and Kane gave a different explanation. You can also see that a 2 pi over 6 rotation exchanges the two Dirac points, so they're at the same energy. And therefore, we're at the situation that I actually drew in, in the first lecture, where there are, the band structure looks a little bit like this. So there are two Dirac points at the same energy, and the Fermi level precisely passes through them, with precisely half of the states being underneath it. That doesn't quite follow from the symmetries. You have to actually look at the whole band structure to make sure that there's no place else in the Brillouin zone. Oh, sorry, in this case it does. In this case, the Hamiltonian was so simple. Bands can't cross except at zero energy, and we found all the places where there was a state of zero energy. So for this model, we actually proved that the structure was like that, and therefore it's qualitatively the same for any sufficiently close model. So this is the model of graphene with two Dirac-like points or four, two, so two massless Dirac particles at low energy, or four if you include spin. Oh, sorry. Forgot that I had the picture. So that's the band structure. <clears throat> now, once you find this, and this was also discussed by Kane, suitable perturbations that break some of the symmetries can give masses to the four gapless Dirac fermions that we found. So there are two famous examples. Haldane chose a perturbation that broke some symmetry and gave masses of the same sign to all Dirac modes. So allowing for spin, this gives a quantum Hall coefficient of 2 times a half plus a half, or 2. And that was the original model showing how you could imagine quantum Hall physics without an applied magnetic field. The only trouble was that um, in the context of of condensed matter, it was hard to see how you would get this type. Well, first of all, graphene wasn't known then. That was one problem. But uh, in general, abstractly, the Haldane story involved strong time reversal violating effects that are hard to see where they would come from in condensed matter. But by now, we know better. Kane and Mele instead, as Kane described in his second lecture, analyzed the effect of the spin orbit coupling that exists in the real world. And they arrived at the spin quantum Hall effect which was the germ of a two-dimensional topological insider. So it's been fun, but I'm afraid we've come to the end. It's time to call it a day. Thank you. Do you recommend any papers of, of yours, maybe? <laughs> well, I'm flattered to be asked, uh, but as of now, there isn't any, well, I can't, I haven't written anything except these slides. <laughs> I haven't written anything with a condensed matter focus except these slides. Yes? Well, the inter well, it depends whether you need to take into account interactions among quasar particles depends on what you want to do. If the quasi particles are nearby, 
then like any other system in condensed matter physics, there will be arbitrarily complicated interactions that are hard to understand. When they're very far apart, the dominant interaction is the statistical one, and that's extremely important. And I didn't, I mean, there's much more to say, but at least I gave the germ of an explanation of where, why there's a statistical interaction. Okay. Doesn't look like there are more. Oh, okay. Yes. We rely on the fact that we have rotational symmetry along the boundary, right? If I... Well, they have uh, the one I used in this explanation, the, yeah. the continuum. That boundary condition had rotational symmetry. What happens if I introduce magnetic theory? Well, it, I, I, I'm not sure. It, it depends on what the starting point was. You don't necessarily have to. The boundary condition I wrote makes sense with the magnetic field. Uh, to, to answer your question. Well, uh, well, there might zero modes are physically sensible sometimes, but, uh, but um, to, to answer your question, I have to know what we're trying to do. I was simply trying to make a mathematical model to prove that the edge states with the churn Simons in bulk is consistent. So, given what I was trying to do, the boundary condition was up to me, and I picked one that was useful. If you're actually studying graphene, for example, first of all, there are inequivalent edges because. Um, obvious, well, that's obvious. That's true in general in condensed matter. But just to stress the point, if we go back to a picture of the lattice, so this edge and maybe that one, and possibly even this one, are all in equivalent. And one of my good intentions that didn't come to fruition, because I just ultimately decided it would be just too complicated to do it in front of you, was to take this model which has its two massless electrons at low energy, and find out what was the effective boundary condition if you terminate the lattice along a given line. So if that's the framework, that you have a real system, and you want to deduce what is the effective boundary condition, you have to calculate the boundary condition starting from the model. But if you're just dreaming up a continuum model out of thin air, you can pick a boundary condition that's appropriate for what you want to study. That was the way I presented it. Yes? Is there a way to start from some massless fermionic matter and get the small a? And get what? Small a. Well, <laughs> you see, there is a more microscopic model of the fractional quantum Hall system, which starts with the Laughlin wave function. Yeah. And it's believed that electrons interacting in a way that is described by something similar to the Laughlin wave function can be described math macroscopically in terms of little a. Right, but it's believed. It's believed, but I'm not sure how explicit the calculations or demonstrations are. I can't add anything <laughs> to whatever has been said about that in the literature, which I don't know an explanation that I find completely satisfactory. Yes? Well, um, it, I probably do have a different convention of the mass. So this determinant um, is non-zero at each of the two points, but it has opposite signs at the two points. And he may have defined the mass without taking into account of that difference. But in my convention, I took account of that difference in effect. That's just because I referred each of them to standard Dirac matrices. And I probably, Charlie, um, took this model as it was. I think he took this model as it was, and he regarded the mass as the coefficient of sigma z. So that would have been a reversed convention from mine. More questions? <clears throat> Anyone? Is this King and Manning model, is it also described by non-trivial homotopy? Well, the kane mele model was the genesis of the topological insulator. So um, it, the understanding eventually involved the Z2 band invariant right. of a time reversal conserving system. Right. So is that, did you describe that using homotopy? Too? Homotopy? Yeah. Well, uh, I think K theory is better, but in low dimensions, you can always, 
the natural explanation is more in terms of K-theory, but you can probably get by with homotopy in low dimensions. I'd better not give you an answer on the fly, though. I recommend, though, the answer based on K-theory. I think that that's the most illuminating. So for those of you who are staying for the second week, you may find that it's a pain to travel the one kilometer between Jadwin and the IAS. But Professor Witten does this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so to make it easier, we purchased a uh, champion racer. <laughs> one kilometer trip more enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. If I'd, if I'd known there were these nice gifts for lectures, I might have worked even harder on preparing these lectures. Uh, so let's come back at uh, 11.